Hey guys, in this video I'm going to address several issues that have been raised by the viewers, specifically with regard to loading models and skeletal animation. We're going to talk about how to load models from the Mixamo website, embedded textures, optimizing the scene hierarchy, and much more. So stay tuned! First, I'd like to say that this tutorial is based on a working skeletal animation implementation using the SIMP library. If you don't have one, then I encourage you to watch my five-part mini-series on this topic. You can find the link in the video description below. Alright, so a guy named Chris sent me an email that he's been having problems loading a model from Mixomo.com. If you're not familiar with this website, I highly recommend that you check it out. It provides a ton of high-quality characters and animations. The website now belongs to Adobe, and according to the license, the models can be used royalty-free for personal, commercial, and non-profit projects, including films and games. And no, unfortunately, this video is not sponsored by Adobe, but it is sponsored by Jean-Sébastien Nadeau, who recently joined the OpenGL Underground. If you too would like to support this channel, you can do that at patreon.com slash ogldev. Okay, so in order to download the models, you need to log in with an Adobe ID, which you can create for free. You don't need a subscription for that. Next, you go to the Characters tab and select the model that you're interested in. I'm going to select the Vanguard model, which is the one that Chris was interested in. Next, we go to the Animations tab and select one of the animations here. And there are literally thousands of animations, right? There are 26 pages at the time I'm recording this, and every page has 96 animations. So basically you can combine each character with every one of these um, 2500-something animations. I'll select the walking animation. We can now click on download, and this will bring up this window where we can configure stuff like frames per second. The most important thing here, in my opinion, is the format. You can choose between six different types of FBX, binary, ASCII, Unity, etc. Or you can use Colada, which is a file format maintained by Kronos, the people who also define the OpenGL specification. Okay, so that was the fun part. Now let's see what happens when you actually try to load this. I tried to load the binary FBX and the Colada files with my code, and got different errors from the SIMP library. Then I tried to use the latest version of SIMP instead of version 501, which comes with my Linux Mint 20.3. In order to do that, you need to grab and build the latest version of SIMP from their Git repo. Next, you need to point your project to the new version. I'm using a very simple build script in all my projects, but it's basically the same principle with make files. In the build script, I removed SIMP from the two calls to package config that retrieved the compile and link flags for the original version that comes with the Linux distro. Instead, I've added dash capital I user include Linux, dash capital L user local lib, and finally dash L SIMP. These are the directories where SIMP installs itself when you do make install. Or you can use the directory where you built the code. If you run LDD on the executable, it will show you the library it was linked against, so you can verify it's the correct version. You may also need to set LD library path to the location of the shared object file. Okay, so now the FBX file loads fine, but in my basic mesh class I'm getting an error that the texture cannot be loaded and there's this weird looking path to the texture file. It actually makes sense because this FBX model came in a single file without any texture files with it. Up until this point, all the models that I've been using in the tutorial series had textures in their own separate files. This introduces another feature in SIMP that we need to support, and that is embedded textures. Textures that are simply part of the model file itself. In order to support loading embedded textures, we need to call get embedded texture on the AI scene class and provide the CString from the path that we got by calling getTexture. GetTexture is part of the existing implementation of the code. If this function returns null, it means that this is a regular texture file and we handle it as usual. 
Else we get a pointer to an AI texture class that encapsulates the memory buffer where SMP loaded the embedded texture. The size of this buffer can be found in the width attribute of the structure. The address of the data itself can be found in the PC data attribute. I've restructured my texture class to support texture loading from both files and memory buffers. Both cases are handled by the STB image library. In the case of embedded textures, we need to call STBI load from memory and provide the address of the memory buffer, the size of the buffer, and the addresses of the width, height, and bits per pixel, where STB will return the values of these variables. The last parameter to this function can be left as zero. This function returns the address where STB extracted a buffer that can be used to create the OpenGL texture. This is required since the embedded texture may be a compressed image like PNG or JPEG, and STB will decompress it for us. The OpenGL texture handling code has been refactored into a function called loadInternal that takes the returned address from STB. You should be familiar with this code as it is shared with the original file-based texture handling path. Okay, so now that we got embedded textures loading correctly, is the model going to run fine? Not bloody likely. We're getting an assertion that we've exceeded the maximum number of four bones per vertex. If you remember, each bone points to the vertices that it influences and we create a reversed mapping of a vertex to the bones that influence it. The bone IDs get into the vertex shader in an IVEC4 so it's not very convenient to extend it to more than four bones per vertex. Turns out that there are actually duplicate instances where the same vertex appears more than once in the bone to vertex array. The assertion is caused by these duplicates where in fact, the bone ID and its weight already exist in our vertex bone data structure. The solution is very simple. When adding a bone and weight to a vertex, we need to check whether this bone already exists and in that case, avoid adding the duplicate. Notice that I'm only checking the bone ID and you may wonder what happens if there are two different weights for the same bone. It's a good question, but I didn't investigate it any further. I don't know if this problem is a result of a bug in SMP or in the modeling software. Now let's see if we can run the FBX model and we are getting a major corruption here. This is definitely wrong, so let's try the Collada model and here's our walking vanguard. Now the crazy thing here is that Chris and I found out that if we import the FBX model into Blender and then export it back to FBX, the animation works okay. So at this point I believe that the problem is probably with SMP, but at least the Collada model works fine. The next story is about a viewer who sent me a link to a very cool model on sketchfab.com. I tried to run the model and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. I spent a couple of hours debugging this problem. I even went as far as loading the model in a third party application where it appeared to be running correctly and compared all the vertices and indices to my own implementation. Everything was the same. Then, as I was going over the vertex shader looking for clues, I saw this hard coded value of a maximum of 100 bones. I remembered that when I printed out all the information about the model, I saw there were actually 165 bones. After increasing the maximum to 200 in the shader, as well as in the C++ code, the missing bone reappeared. However, there are still a few corrupted triangles. Further investigation revealed that in some cases there were bones with zero weights that had to be skipped. After fixing these two problems, the model animated correctly. Now the original request from the viewer was to add support for multiple animations. This turned out to be very easy to implement with SMP. The AI scene class has an array of animations. In my original implementation, I used to access the first element by default. Providing the animation index from the application allowed me to bind the keys one through four in order to switch between the four different animations that this model provides. The last story for today is a request from a viewer to optimize the node hierarchy. 
The thing is that the hierarchy may include nodes that have nothing to do with bones. This is because the nodes have a broader use beyond the bones, but in the specific case of animation, it makes sense to find a way to skip processing these unnecessary nodes. Now, SMP does provide an AI process optimized graph flag, which according to the documentation is supposed to collapse and join nodes with animation, bones, etc. However, there is also a warning here that this flag should be used with caution. In the case of the Raptoid mascot model, we can see that there are 200 nodes, while there are only 165 bones. I was able to load the model just fine with the optimized graph flag, and the number of nodes dropped to 187, so it seems like we can squeeze this further using manual work. It may not seem a lot in this case, but in some models the effect may be significant, so it's good to know that there is such an option. SMP even provides a description for a manual optimization algorithm. Basically, we need to create a map and populate it with all the nodes in the hierarchy. This map tells us whether the nodes are required and the initial state for each bone is false. We then need to traverse all the bones and for each bone find the corresponding node. The matching is done by comparing names. This node is marked as required in the map. The next step is to traverse from the node all the way to the root of the hierarchy and mark each node along the way as required. After completing this process for all the bones, we have a required or not required indicator for each node. Note that when the node is not required, it means that its children are also not required. Let's go over the implementation of the algorithm in our skinned mesh class. I've added a map that matches a node name to a small info structure that includes the pointer to the node and the is required flag. The pointer will make it easier to find the node later on. The function initialize required node map initializes the map by going over the node's children and recursively calling itself for each node. The first call to this function is of course with the root node. Next we have the function mark required nodes for bone. This function must be called for each bone. It finds the corresponding node in the map, sets the is required flag to true, and traverses to the root while handling all the intermediate nodes in the same way. The map is now initialized and we can start using it. We do that in the read node hierarchy function. Instead of simply traversing all the children of each node, we check the map first and skip the ones that are not required. Obviously, this implementation can be optimized even further. I just wanted to do a basic demonstration of the algorithm. That's it for today. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next tutorial.